So, so much of this conference is talking about the what's of just incredible innovation happening around us. I'd like to spend some time talking about the hows that go behind a lot of that innovation. So I was recently at a board meeting of a large academic medical center. And the subject was their annual strategic planning process. And the head of the system was talking about hundreds of millions of dollars invested in primary research and hundreds of millions of, doctor, uh, millions of dollars uh, put into applied research. And all of this with the intention of maintaining the reputation and an actual lead in technology in a bunch of areas. And as he was going through this presentation, a hand went up. And it was a board member who actually in his past had been the CEO of one of the big three car makers in the US. And he had a pretty simple question. He said, look, this is great, and I appreciate all the things that you're doing. He said, but in my industry, we spent billions of dollars a year on R&D. And then this little company called Uber came along, and with an actually relatively modest investment, is completely upending our industry. And all of those multi-year plans that we've made have really kind of gone out the window. How are you planning for something like that? And of course, the chancellor stopped and kind of stuttered a little bit and tried to come up with an answer. And you know, there's not a good answer to that question, right? Let's be honest. I originally thought when he asked, he said, that's a really unfair question, right? Because it's a trick question. You can't plan for something like that. But as I thought about it more, and as I've observed so many large companies and what's happening in our economy, I've finally come to recognize it's really probably the single most profound question that every company needs to ask. Because in a world of disruption that we're seeing happen around us, we all have to plan for the unknowable, for the unplannable. And so if it's the most profound question that we all need to address, what's the answer? And I finally realized, well, you can't. And I think this drives so much of what we're seeing happening around digital transformation today, is we live in a much more uh, volatile, uncertain, complex world where our ability to plan out in multi-year cycles is really a fool's errand. We don't know. We don't know how 5G is exactly going to uh, unroll. Nobody knows exactly when autonomous driving is going to happen and how. We don't know really how you know, IoT on the edge is going to ultimately unfold. We all have ideas around it. We all have aspirations around it, and that's fine. But none of us knows with enough clarity and detail to fundamentally put together the types of plans that we need to put together to be successful. Here's the good news. Just because we can't plan effectively into an unknowable world, whether that's because of volatility or because of the impact of innovation that we all need to look to drive, that doesn't mean that we're powerless to deal with it. But what we're ultimately going to all need to do as organizations over time is frankly spend a little less time planning and a lot more time equipping our organizations to deal with constant change and volatility. Most of our, us here are here because our organizations have been successful in a world that no longer quite exists, in a world where we knew the future well enough that we could plan for it, and almost everybody in this room's organizations are excellent at execution. And that's what got us to where we are. The issue is it's just unclear that's going to be able to get us to where we need to go. So I'm the CEO of Red Hat, and who is Red Hat, and therefore, what, and what am I doing here talking about this? Well, Red Hat, hopefully most of you know us. We're the leading provider of Linux and OpenStack and container platforms for telcos and traditional enterprises around the world. But I think what makes us unique is how our model works. So our innovation model is 100% open source. And what that means is we spend the majority of our time innovating, working in open source communities, which today are often led by the largest Web 2.0 companies, the 
in this context, the over-the-top type of companies uh, every single day, right? We work with Google on Kubernetes. We work with, you know, all of the, the, the major web players to do innovation. But then our business model is taking those innovations and turning those into products that are capable of running the most mission-critical applications in the world. And virtually every major company in the world, every telco, service provider, et cetera, are all large customers of Red Hat, typically using these uh, pieces of technology in relatively mission-critical environments. And A, that model where we are working upstream with innovators has kept us relevant for a long time as we've moved from generation to generation of technology. But importantly, I think it gives us an interesting vantage point where we spend half our time working with a new generation of companies with a different set of capabilities around innovation and we spend the other half working with large organizations around the world who have traditionally been excellent at execution. And when we look at where we are going in the 21st century, the key is how do those things come together? Because observing the large web companies, they have built a set of capabilities to innovate at scale which are phenomenal. And that set of capabilities, frankly, looks a lot different than more traditional organizations who over generations have built an excellent capability to execute at scale in more static environments. And I think most organizations now recognize that they need to inject a greater de uh, degree of innovation into their companies and into the capabilities of their company. But unfortunately, it's difficult to figure out exactly how you do this. And I've talked to so many companies like, hey, we sent our executive team to go visit Google and Facebook and some of those Silicon Valley companies. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I can tell you to be successful, you don't necessarily want Google's culture. What you need to do is think about how you graft components of innovation capabilities into your existing culture, right? Real winners are gonna be companies that can continue to execute well, but build a greater capability to innovate. And that really requires changes in leadership processes and a whole set of cultural elements uh, in your organizations. This is personal to me, and ultimately, it will require personal transformation from leaders. The reason I say it's personal to me is I've had a chance to live this right up front and center. Before joining Red Hat, I was chief operating officer and I ran Delta Airlines on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, airlines are some of the largest single business unit organizations um, in the world, right? These are literally single businesses where everything has to come together. And they're absolutely optimized to drive efficiency and safety on a global basis in a very complex operating environment. And so over time, they are the most classical hierarchical structures built to drive efficiency in a static environment that you can possibly see. And then one day I moved from Red Hat and became this, uh, from Delta and became the CEO of Red Hat. And I'll be honest with you, when I first got there, I thought, I am in the middle of chaos. This company is incredibly immature. It has no idea how professional management works, and I've clearly been in here to clean it up. There was an embedded irreverence in the culture. There was a, not only a willingness to, but almost a feeling of obligation to question authority that I thought were all artifacts of the open source movement that Red Hat emerged from, and were things that over time needed to be pounded out as we professionalized it. But luckily, before I had a chance to do that, I actually finally understood that Red Hat's model is just a different model for a different outcome. So the traditional management structures that Delta uses is a great way to optimize for efficiency in a static environment. The model that Red Hat uses is a great way to drive efficiency, or to drive uh, innovation in a uh, fast-changing kind of dynamic environment. And there's not one's right, one's wrong. It is a different way to run an organization for a different objective function. And I think as executives start to figure that out, it becomes much easier to think about how you put those two pieces together. 
And so I've become passionate about this because I literally feel like I'm the frog who jumped out of the boiling water. There's this old kind of tale that, you know, you put a frog in cold water and slowly turn up the temperature, it never recognizes the difference and ultimately dies. But if you throw the frog in boiling water, it recognizes the change and jumps out. Well, I'm the frog thrown in the boiling water, right? Going literally one day at Delta Airlines, next day at Red Hat, I recognize, oh my God, there's something amazing happening here that's fundamentally different. And I think for so many executives, this need to move from solely focusing on efficiency to needing to drive a higher level of innovation has happened slowly over time. And so many executives I talk to say, my organization needs to be more innovative Yet, they don't recognize their leadership style, the management processes and systems, everything about the organization is built to drive efficiency and drive out any capability for innovation. And so I feel like I was really given a gift, and one of the things I want to share over the next little while is at least thoughts around how to inject a greater degree of innovation capability into an organization. And let me emphasize, it really is personal. I was talking to the CEO of a Fortune 20 company, so a massive company who you all know. He didn't give me permission to use his name, so I won't use it. But in his organization, he said, look, the problem we had is we used to do one major innovation about every 15 years, and then we spent the next 15 years exploiting it. And then, you know, that would run off of patents and people would catch up and we'd have to innovate again. And he said, you know, in that world, guess what? We're really good at executing because we spent 15 years exploiting an innovation and only one year innovating. He said, but now as the world's changed, changed as innovation cycles have gotten shorter, all of a sudden we have to innovate all the time. And so we've been on a path over the last couple of years of how do we reorient to be more innovative? And I tried and we've tried and we failed. And he said, you know what? I woke up one day and said, oh my God, it's not my organization needing to change. It's I need to change. This is a personal transformation of self. I can't get my organization to change if I don't change and I'm a part of that. And I hope that comes through over the next few pages as I, uh, as I talk a bit about what that looks like. Um, I also want to emphasize there is no right answer. You can't go hire a consultant or read a book and say, here's what I'm going to go do, because everyone's starting points are different. Everyone's objective function of where you need to go are different. So I am definitely not up here saying, ooh, come be Red Hat. Happy to have people visit. You can see what we do. But I'm not saying that people should be Red Hat. We are at one point kind of, I would say, on the extreme of the need to innovate in ambiguity. And honestly, innovation or uh, execution and uh, efficiency are a little less important than our ability to innovate. But I do want to talk about some of the core themes that I think really do cut across um, really any company as you're trying to both fix where you need to be on this continuum of execution and innovation, um, and how you can start to think about areas to move one way or another. So key three th uh, themes I want to walk through. First is that planning's dead. I said that early on. I hope you've gotten that message, that our ability to plan into an unknowable future um, makes planning less and less and less effective. I'll spend a minute or two talking about so, well, what replaces that? Second, I want to talk about the nature of innovation and how optimizing innovation is very different than driving efficiency. And then finally, I want to talk about innovation versus execution and how those things look different. So planning is dead. What replaces it? So again, this idea of the traditional management system is plan or figure out what you want to do, then prescribe or dictate, OK, here's how we're going to go do it, and then Execution is holding people accountable against that plan or driving compliance. So if you want to think about that whole cycle as kind of sort of what we do, you know, figure out what to do, tell people to go do it, and then hold them accountable against that. Well, in an unknowable world, that whole chain starts to break apart because you're not exactly sure what to do. And even if you could and you could prescribe it, it's changing so fast that you have to start to change that whole process. 
So there's a lot of process things that one can do, and there's been a lot written about, and there are a lot of articles about some of the basic things, like applying agile to your organization structure, or, or you've heard about you know, minimum viable product, if, if hopefully you've all read uh, Lean Startup. It's a, it's a great book, but it talks about, so start with the nub, try, learn, modify, uh, is a process approach. So there's a bunch of good process things you can do. Highly recommend starting to think about how you, again, apply whether it's a minimum viable product approach or a, a, uh, uh, a agile approach more broadly to your organization. That's important and it's hard, but it's probably one of the easier things you can do. <laughs> You're certainly thinking about modular business and technology architectures, you know, layers and APIs. Amazon's absolutely famous for that. But the hardest thing that you, leaders have to do is recognize your role goes from making decisions and holding people accountable to creating context in which your people can make their decisions. Just a quick analogy, the communist economies of Eastern Europe in the 80s and 90s, you know, the general theory or academic kind of dogma would be they fell apart because it's impossible to centrally plan something as complex uh, and as fast moving as an economy. So that doesn't work. And so a market oriented approach is a more effective way to run an economy. And now market oriented is a broad thing. You can have very different, vastly different types of economies around the world that have been successful, but they generally start with a central authority government setting fiscal policy and monetary policy and industrial policy and a legal system in which individual actors operate. And around the world, virtually every successful economy has some structure like that. So somehow we know at the economy level when things are complex, we can't centrally plan, we have to set structures and let people execute within those. Yet as our own businesses get more and more complex, what do we do? We try to hold on tighter. So ultimately to be successful in a world where we can't prescribe and hold people accountable because we don't know enough about the world and the world is changing too fast, you have to let go. It's about building uh, resilience, agility, and creativity into your organization so your people can make those decisions. And as leaders, that is a fundamental mind shift, and it is a difficult transition that people need to make. Next, our organizations are structured to drive efficiency, right? And so what people do every day is typically coordinating activities. So after you've prescribed what you're going to go do, you coordinate. You, have meetings, to, you manage information flows, you work to resolve individual problems, you make sure you know, things that arise get coordinated and solved. In a world where so much more value creation happens around innovation, what you do every day needs to change. It becomes less, you know, coordination is all about how do I take variants out. Innovation is about how do I inject a greater uh, degree of innovation in. And that starts with like, having a lot of ideas. So creating the context where you get a lot of ideas. And you know, conversely, as you think about your management systems, it's hard to, well, it's uh, counterintuitive, but incentive compensation actually makes people less creative. There's a lot of academic research that kind of goes through the, the higher stakes decisions are, the less creative people are. So all of a sudden as leaders, it's things like, well at Red Hat, the first months I was at Red Hat, I kept getting these emails where I would be copied on, you know, people who'd been in meetings saying, hey, congratulations, great job, you did a great job at this, or hey, Jim, can you write notes, personal notes to people because they did X, Y, or Z. So building a culture that has much more of celebration, that's much more mission focused, that actually tries to use intrinsic incentives and executives to build intrinsic incentives is absolutely critical in stable ta uh, table stakes. What it isn't is making a happy place where you congratulate people every day on great ideas. Because I want to focus on the word forged for a second. There's a lot of academic research that says brainstorming, this idea of you get positive feedback for ideas, is fantastic at generating a lot of ideas. And it's horrible at generating good ideas. Because truly good ideas are built on ideas, built on ideas, built on ideas. And to get that to happen, it means that you have to tease apart and tear apart ideas. So it's not saying great job, it's saying I disagree with that or that's good, but. 
And one of the most important things you all as leaders need to do is build a culture of trust where those hard conversations can happen. I remember my second week at Red Hat, we were having a meeting about a technology area. And I have my head of all products and technology there, the head of engineering who worked for him, the head of an area of engineering who worked for the head of engineering and some of the engineers. And they're briefing me on this area and our strategy around it. And about halfway through, one of the engineers says, I know this is our strategy, but I think this is fundamentally wrong. We're taking the wrong approach and here's why. And of course, a huge argument ensues and all this happens in front. And in the end, we kind of finish up and everybody kind of walks out happy. And I remember going home to my wife, sorry, I'm like two weeks out of Delta at this point, and saying, I just had the most bizarre meeting. And I kind of recount that. And my, my point is, and I think a lot of you will, this will resonate, it's like, at Delta, if a junior engineer in front of their boss, boss's boss, boss's boss's boss, said to the CEO, I totally disagree with what they're telling you, that person certainly would have been fired before the end of the day, maybe killed before the end of the meeting, right? But fundamentally, if you want to have a more agile, resilient organization, those dialogues have to happen. Turns out about six months later, we pivoted because that engineer turned out to be right. But if we hadn't had that, that dialogue, we would have had a much more of a, ooh, let me hide this mistake, or now I gotta re-educate because I said this, and now I gotta get leaders to believe that. Being able to have those dialogues is critical to be successful. Ed Catmull, who's the uh, head of Pixar, makes animated movies, once said, your organization cannot be creative if there's more honesty at the water cooler than there is in the conference room. In other words, if people are whispering on the issues but not willing to have those hard conversations, you can't be creative. So as leaders, you have to drive a tone in your organization, job one, in order to be creative. The final thing I'll say here, the majority of great ideas are gonna happen outside your company. Sure math, I don't care the biggest company in the room, more people work outside that company than inside that company. And your ability to embrace external technologies, to get involved in those technologies will be critical. The majority of innovation today isn't happening from vendors, and this is a vendor up here saying this, it is happening in user-driven communities, containers, OpenStack, big data, machine learning. Those are all happening uh, in user-driven communities. Now, that may be driven by Amazon and Google and some of those others, but those are open technologies that anyone can get involved in. You have to have a strategy to engage with and leverage those technologies, or there's no way you're gonna be able to keep up with the pace of innovation. Finally, recognize innovation is fundamentally different than execution. And traditional organizations have this issue of thinking, I innovate in order to put that in production, and therefore I bend my innovation cycles to fit production. So I innovate for a while, but then I gotta freeze the spec because I gotta go put this thing in production. And we're all used to that, and everybody kind of nods. Like, of course, you gotta freeze the spec, have stability, et cetera, et cetera. I would actually propose a very different approach. If you really look how key, like, web innovators, and I don't wanna keep coming back to them, but broadly how great innovation uh, projects work is they're continuous. Sometimes it's a huge flow, sometimes it's a dribble, but they are continuous streams of innovation. Now, of course, you can't implement something that's always changing. Implementation's a different process. So all of a sudden you have to figure out, well, how do I pull off of that stream of innovation to execute, but in doing so, don't stop the innovation from happening. I'll use the example of some op great open source projects, right? Linux changes every day. OpenStack changes every week with a major release every six months. Those projects are successful because they're never stopped and started for an innovation cycle. They continue as a flow. Execution, then, is an interrelated process. So rather than think about one thing, I innovate for a while, I stop, and now I execute, Think of innovation as a continuous process. Now execution becomes interesting then because execution comes, how do I dip into that pool of innovation and then execute? And certainly, you know, Red Hat does that for a living. We can tell you it is doable. We run some of the most mission critical systems in the world. But I just implore you, do not stop people from innovating. Innovation is a constant thing. Execution is an episodic thing. Recognize those are fundamentally different and build and think about systems around that. Again, I'm not up here telling you be Red Hat. Every company is different, and I really like that metaphor of grafting DNA. You need to augment what you are doing. 
In the 21st century, the winners will be great innovators who learn how to execute in the physical world and great executors who learn how to innovate at a greater pace. It is a daunting challenge. You know, I haven't used the word culture in this presentation, and that's been intentional. To some extent, it's all about culture, but I hear too many executives who say, I finally figured out it's my culture. I need to be more innovative in my culture. And in one sense, yes, that is exactly right. This is all about building more innovative cultures. In another sense, that's not where you start, right? Culture is an output of leadership and processes and systems, right? You know, most psychologists will tell you behaviors are rational, you know, results of the context in which somebody operates. The same is true of culture in an organization. Yes, you, many organizations say, I need to have my culture be more innovative, but that starts not with directly changing culture because culture is an output. It is leaders and leaders' roles, it's processes and systems. So it's hard because you're talking about people change. But I just implore all of you, we're all gonna keep planning. I know I said planning's dead. We're all gonna keep planning. Of course, we're thinking years in advance. But spend at least as much time thinking about how you unleash your people's potential to act in the moment, to innovate, to apply judgment and creativity, because ultimately, the winners in the 21st century will be the ones who've enabled their organizations to pivot and react to change. Thank you very much. It's great to be here.